I'm TJ Manisterski, and this is my Coaching Project podcast, where I connect with leaders in search of breakthrough knowledge. Breakthrough knowledge challenges the status quo, changes your opinion, or fundamentally opens your eyes in a way there is no turning back. Subscribe to the Coaching Project monthly newsletter at tjmanisterski.com. You can find the direct link in the show notes. I've been at this for two months, and the number of subscribers has already doubled. I would love it if you joined our growing community. This is a place for curious people and leaders from any industry who want to inspire performance and maximize individual development and team success. So come on out and play with us. Today, I'm joined by Nate Leslie, who might just be the most interesting man in hockey. (laughs) His experiences are so vast and exotic. uh, I was having a real tough time trying to come up with an intro. So rather than try to summarize it myself, I'm going to read a passage directly from Legacy Global Sports website, lgsports.ca, and I think you'll understand why. These are Nate's words. I've lived a life of adventure, achievement, and defeat. I owe a vast majority of the highs and the lows to hockey. I've played in one of the best pro leagues in the world and arguably one of the worst. Pro hockey gave me an incredible memories, but also lows that threatened my love of the game. In one hockey season, I went from nearly playing in the Spangler Cup to earning $1 an hour in a New York City restaurant job. With challenge comes adversity and opportunities for growth. In my free time, I've watched the sunset on Mount Everest from 19,000 feet, run out of oxygen scuba diving, slept in an active volcano, and forgot all the lyrics to a song in my first official gig on stage. Nate Leslie, welcome to The Coaching Project. Thank you very much for having me, TJ. That is a cool, cool story. And the first thing I want to know is what was the name of your band? That was my brother-in-law and I got the chance to open for a great band in a little cultural center pub. And I think we did have a name, but that was maybe... Gosh, I can't even remember. It was it was a it was a night to remember and a night to forget. I think it was, whatever the name was, it was some cheesy thing that our wives came up with or something. That's cool. Very cool. Okay, so what has been the lasting impact from narrowly missing out on the Spangler Cup to making a dollar an hour in a New York City restaurant? Oh man, the ups and downs, and I think the. One of the things to be really honest that I struggled with as a pro player was when, how much was out of my control. And, you know, you, you tell your players, you just keep doing all the right things, kid, and you'll get in the lineup. But I had coaches that would just say, you know, just try and do all the right things, but they'd leave out that part, like, and you might get in the lineup. And, um, So the highs and lows to that day in that restaurant where I thought, holy cow, how did I end up here? And this is not what I thought it was going to be like. All of that culminated into my next life, my next chapter. I need to, it needs to matter. My value needs to matter. I need to, I guess social entrepreneur, social entrepreneurship, I could sum, sum it up as I need to be in the driver's seat in charge of my successes and my failures. I got to own them both. And, um, and I got to take what I've learned and take the ups and downs and know that for a lot of people, those highs and lows in their professional lives might not be as extreme. And that's going to be my advantage. Like Sinatra said, I, I'm sure I told myself that night, if I can make it here, I can make it anywhere. And a couple of years later, I was the athletic director in a boarding school on Central Park South. So that was, uh, and then I said it a lot. If I can make it here, I can make it anywhere in, in, in big, bad New York City. So that's, uh, that's the lasting impact, I think. Sure. Now, what I'm hearing there is a sense of, of real purpose. And uh, sure, there's adventure and there's highs and lows and really some exotic things. But it, like a, a person who is just driven by, by purpose and experience and, and having an impact. And I, I also read that, so when you were the, the working at the boarding school, you started this hockey development program. And, and was this in West Harlem? Is that where the boarding school was? 
Yeah, the, the West Harlem opportunity came first, and I owe a lot to a couple of great individuals who, who trusted me there. But from that came the opportunity to, uh, to work at, at the boarding school. Yeah, it was. Yeah. So what was that like building a hockey development program in Harlem? I'll try and give you the short version. I had spent some time, I had followed an ex-girlfriend to New York City, and uh, which led to that job in that restaurant. And um, in, then I left for a while and I had an opportunity to came, come back. I got a call from two fathers who I had met through coaching their kids at Lasker Rink in Central Park. And they said, Nate, we'd like you to come back to New York and we, there's this opportunity you can coach at our son's private school we our, our kids are in this world here in new york and make some money from that and we'll get you some opportunity to coach some other sports where our, in our daughter's school and the main crux of the program is going to be or the project is going to be you do those things so that you can be the coach at this program in in west harlem that at the time had about 15 kids in it from ages 7 to 13 maybe and I arrived in New York City and they said, they, these both gentlemen, they both handed me $10,000 each. And I had never seen that kind of money. And they said, this isn't about you, Nate. This is about the coaches that we had, specifically John Shanahan said, this is about the coaches I had growing up in Australia who helped me become the man I am today. And this is just to make sure that this expensive city that we've just asked you to move to, that you can get your legs under you and that you're not worried about paying rent for the first few months while we get things up and running. And um, John and Ken Hirsch and a few other really influential uh, volunteers, we grew that program to about 150 kids and it ranged from their kids were on the team as well as sort of their second team to kids from West Harlem who uh, who's who had never spent a night in a hotel uh, and, you know, took them to a tournament in Delaware. It was like the bad news bears going to Delaware. And it was just to see that this range in life experiences coming together for that shared experience. Um, I will never forget that moment. And John passed away a couple of years ago uh, on a cycling trip with his wife in, in Italy. And so I think um, his legacy lives, lives on. In fact, I used one of those checks and paid for my master's degree in education. So, um, you know, it, it just keeps giving. Amazing. Amazing. And I know that bringing, bringing hockey to non-traditional areas and using it as a vehicle to create experience and opening horizons is something that you've done a lot of in other countries like New Zealand and Mongolia. And, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to pin you down on the Mongolian adventure here in a little bit, but uh, you know, I think that the, the thing that, you know, we've had an opportunity to chat a little bit about is executive coaching. And that's one of the things that you do. And it's really interesting to me because I've often thought about coaches as people who believe in coaching, right? Like we, we fundamentally think that it works and there's value to it, but who's coaching the coaches. Mm -hmm. And I wonder where that thought takes you. It actually takes me to the guy that connected you and I, uh, Glenn Williamson, uh, who was a friend of my father's. They played university hockey together in, uh, gosh, the 70s, Brandon University in Manitoba in Canada. And the foundation of my first 17 years post playing career uh, in youth hockey development, the foundation of our model, and Glenn helped us with this, is how to get as many kids on the ice as you can and keep them really busy and keep them learning and keep them having fun and help the volunteer coaches along the way. And if you, because none of us will be around forever, if we can leave a program better than we found it, then that's really our job. So we coach the players through the volunteer coaches. And, you know, as I am a lifelong learner and always trying to challenge myself that those 17 years have led me into my new a business in a certified executive coaching. And yeah, it's lonely at the top. So that's the other thing that comes to mind is it's lonely at the top. And so often leaders put pressure on themselves to have the answers. You don't have to have all the answers. In fact, you don't even necessarily need to find someone who has the answers that they can give to you. You need to create a community for yourself. And maybe it's with a trained professional 
like a certified executive coach that holds you capable of finding the solutions to your challenges. But the minute you think that you need to have the answers, the pressure and anxiety that comes with that is significant. And so are the blind spots that you uh, create for yourself because um, you, you think in that moment to those players that you need to have that answer. So, yeah. That's, uh, that's so true. The loneliness at the top. And I'm, I'm looking through my papers right now because you mentioned Glenn Williamson. And I'm not sure if I can find it here, but talk about uh, mentorship or coaches, uh, helping coaches. I, I have a, a tablecloth. This sounds silly that I still have from a lunch or a dinner that we had together, Glenn and I, and I, and all the notes that we had on this, this tablecloth. And I kept it cause I thought it was hilarious and, and, and amazing. Which looks, so I got to cut, which looks exactly like his practice plans, but anyways, go ahead. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> and so, I know he's going to hear this. Yeah, for sure. Uh, but uh, yeah, no, like, I think we are, if you're, if you're intentional about it, you can create a circle of people that you can lean on and help you. And you certainly need it. And, but, but there's times when, you know, you can have all these awesome theories and ideas in the summertime, but it's not so crystal clear in December and January and February when you're in the heat of the battle and, and it's game after game and practice after practice. And to be able to have somebody that you can speak to who's removed from the fire a little bit mm -hmm. and can help guide you and bring some clarity, I think is extremely valuable. And, you know, I wonder too, because you, you have the West coast prep camp in the summer mm -hmm. that is actually legendary in some coaching circles for some of this coach development piece, not, they love the camp. They love the log cabin, the mountain, the river, the ocean, and all the fun stuff. But what I hear about this experience is the connecting of the coaches sort of after hours and the presentations and then the camaraderie that comes, comes out of it. And you know, yeah, you, you tell me about you, that. Yeah, for sure. You know what? That's an interesting one because, and Glenn has been influential. Glenn was going there with his kids before the five of us that own it now ever bought it. And he came out for a long time. And and we could have gone the showcase route where kids just show up and they play games for scouts. And we were insistent for the exact same reasons on the development model. You get all those great coaches there who are scouting the kids. Let's hear from them. Let's get them. Let's get you working with the kids on the ice instead of just sitting scouting from the stands. And if we had to, if all the coaches had to live in a hotel, that experience would be totally different, but we have a fishing lodge on the river near the ocean and the informal time, the sharing of ideas that come back at 10 at night and there's coaches got their, their, they got their hard drives out, their thumb drives out and they're sharing ideas. And sometimes we, the insecurities think, oh, they've probably had enough of that. Like we don't want to add more to their role. And we actually surveyed them a couple of years ago and said, essentially what do you appreciate most and it was like yeah the coaching development opportunities so we've formalized those in the form of a fireside chat whether it's uh, whether there's an actual fire going or we're just uh, it's normally too hot there in the summer so we're just hanging out but whether it's listening to brendan morris and tell stories or mike johnson or barry smith or glenn williamson or bob leslie our feature guest coaches there's always the layer of experience from our you know um prep school type what we call major midget here or academy program coaches to multiple stanley cup winners i don't want to call it a pecking order but there's a feature coach and um so much sharing of ideas and then we give that give our our most special guests the stage to present something that's important to them you know which has led with the barry smith thing to our barry smith master class that you're going to join on wednesday and that's that um it's lonely at the top and there's sharing of ideas and as you mentioned in the heat of the fire that's when you need it most that's when you need community the most of all and that's when in a in a macho sport culture we might say oh this is when i gotta 
just go into my office and don't want anyone to bother me and I got to come out of here pretending like I know what I'm doing and the vulnerability that you bring to your own coaching you you know you know in your heart which is more impactful and that's community and collaboration and sharing of ideas and spitballing ideas and and then getting of course getting insight from from people that have been there and done that and then making it your own right sure I think that community is really important no matter what level you coach one of the issues, though, is is oftentimes, I guess at some of the higher levels, if you're not talking about grassroots and youth hockey, if you're talking about junior, college, or pro, oftentimes your network is also coaching. They're in their own fires at the same time as you are. So that's where I think you, you need – it's really helpful to have somebody, you know, like yourself as an executive coach or a Glenn Williamson who who has a little more free time and to, to talk to you uh, – you know, at his stage in his career. So that's, that's really influential and and helpful. Now I want to ask you a question. How do we ask better questions Mm -hmm. to connect with our athletes? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. And I've spent hundreds of hours training in how to ask better questions. As a trained executive coach, it is my obligation to ask a question without the attachment to being right. In other words, humans normally ask a question with a bias as what they think the answer should be. It's a weird thing about our psyche and our ego. The most fascinating moments come when you ask a question and you're totally open to any answer. Uh, Open questions rather than closed questions are really powerful. So did you have a good game tonight is a yes or no question that's closed. And from an athlete, you might even just get a grunt or silence versus what was the best part of tonight's game? What was the most challenging part of tonight's game? When did you feel at your best tonight? What happened where you doubted yourself tonight? Questions that force and never in a row like that ask a question and shut up and listen and wait because in the 5 10 15 oh my god 20 seconds it might take to answer that's where the gold is and most of us hate we could try it right now but we won't waste the air time uh more than three or four seconds of of dead time but that moment of silence especially for someone who's a bit more analytical your student athletes in accounting and finance think through things slightly differently than the drama student who wears his or her heart on their sleeve, right? Um, so it's ask the question like a what or how question that requires more than a one word answer and giving them space without expectation of what they might say. Do you have any experience with what I've heard referred to as like the doorknob confession? So you, you, you have this conversation with somebody and you're asking questions and you, you, you know, maybe you're trying to get information and you're doing your best to ask all these wonderful questions as you've outlined. And, you know, maybe they give you a lot, maybe they don't, but just as they're about to leave, they say something. And often that that is the, the thing that they've been thinking about or holding back on or the most profound piece of information. So you might have been trying to have this conversation for 20 minutes, but it's that sort of what seemingly is an offhand comment on the way out the door. Gotcha. I know exactly what you mean. And in some professional development this morning, we talked about it. What else? So you've asked a question. Maybe you've got an insightful answer and there's more because you're their coach there's more and they're not saying it because it's probably the most important it might expose their emotion the most it might expose an insecurity what else is on your mind and sit and listen it's that so i love that i'm going to borrow that uh, from you as the hand reaches the doorknob it's that thing And that is where the gold is going to come in the conversation and that connection that we've talked about is going to happen. So 
what else? And, and something else comes to mind as you describe that, which might be, again, trying not to be attached to it, might be useful or might not be, is setting up the parameters about what's to happen. Hey, I'd like to talk to you about last night's game. What time works for you tomorrow? You know, um, maybe we can spend 20 minutes exploring what worked and what didn't. And then I could ask you right now what's resonating with you about that and it might be something around well now they've got a chance to think about it they're not caught off guard they're not on their heels they're not feeling like they're under the gun like hey you got a minute you know whoa what i do hey can i talk to you oh god what is you oh, oh i'm i'm gone i'm getting i'm 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 going back to manitoba you know i'm on the next bus <laughs> right versus i'd love to talk to you about the game tomorrow specific time maybe we'll chat 20 minutes think about what resonated in the game so that communication that connection setting the stage setting the table that you know you're actually coming for dinner does that make sense totally because otherwise you're just inducing this unnecessary anxiety in that person yeah. and everybody's anxious to a certain degree but it certainly seems like more and more people at least the age that i'm coaching are are at least open to saying that they are more uh, that they're anxious they have some some various degrees of anxiety and and when you just say hey i want to talk to you tomorrow there's this power dynamic that this is the head coach saying hey, i want to talk to you and he's not saying why so now your head is just spinning and i've learned over the years that the issues one of the biggest issues in communication is when you you want really want to try to avoid those communication gaps because people make up their own story if yeah. in the absence of communication and their stories are usually never very productive. Like they're always worse than reality or their, or their, their fears are coming into play. So I totally love the point of, of setting the table. So they know they're coming for dinner. Mm -hmm. I think that makes total mm -hmm. sense. And the other point you made about the setting the time we did, So in, on your podcast, you and I discussed that after action review that we'll do with my team. And one of the ways we got better and better at this was early on, we set a time limit. So right. we would say, we're going to do this after action review for 16 minutes. And we just, I picked a random, like rather than mm -hmm. say 20 or 15, mm -hmm. we picked this sure. weird number, right? And yep. we put the clock on it and we said, so we could be, we might be silent, but we'll be silent for 16 minutes. And, and then we had somebody sort of say, okay, five minutes left, two minutes left or whatever, gave somebody the job of, of keeping time and the stuff that happened in the last minute was the stuff that mattered the most like it, it's okay. almost like they're they were i don't know if they're saving it or what but um similar to that doorknob confession idea yeah yeah very similar yeah the sick the final the, the buzzer beater comment eh, is it's on their mind and and you talked about using that muscle and practicing and those conversations have been getting better this might resonate with you. So your conduct as the leader creates an atmosphere, whether you like it or not. Sure. Positive, negative, mad, angry, happy, joking, loose, tight. Your conduct creates an atmosphere. It, it just is. That atmosphere influences your team to start to create a story about themselves. You just alluded to that, that they start to tell a story. Oh, I, I screwed up. I'm getting cut. I'm getting traded. Oh, I'm getting off the power play. And you just want to re review the power play. But your conduct, hey, can you talk to me? Come in, talk to me for a second. Created that atmosphere where they start to tell their story. And there are all sorts of things in their life that influence the story that they're going to tell themselves based on the environment that you set with your conduct. Yeah. And we all do it, right? Like yeah. it's not just our players. It's, um, we, we all make up these stories in our mind about, <laughs> about these things. So again, it goes back to uh, being intentional with that communication and, and it's worse with, with, with texting right? And digital communication, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. you can create that feeling by accident, just because yeah. of what's the mood of the person receiving that text, or what are yeah. their impressions of your relationship at that moment? 
How are they feeling about you? How are they feeling about themselves? And then this text comes in and all you're saying is, Hey, can we meet for five minutes tomorrow? Like you think it's totally innocent yeah. and it just sends them into a tailspin. Yeah. Let me, let me back up one sec. I used the example of the conduct you as coach you as human, me as human. And leadership is a choice, as I'm sure you're trying to instill in your players. It's a choice, not a position. It's not just for the captains and the assistants. So as a human, part of that community that you're creating, the way people conduct themselves in every moment creates that atmosphere. So, and that, that's culture. Culture you feel, right? Culture you just, it's on your skin. It's kind of in your head. It's uh, over your shoulder. It's in front of you. It, it is what it is. And it's created by the way people conduct themselves. And, and um, so that sort of transcends power position to leadership as a, as a way of being. I guarantee you two things weren't happening when I played junior in college. We weren't talking about stuff like this and we weren't texting. There was no texting yeah. issue because it was pre-cell phone, but those two things are certain. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, I want to segue here to Rinks of Hope, Project Mongolia. And I will put the link to the video of this documentary in the show notes of this podcast because it was I watched it and it was unbelievable. Can you can you share with me why did you endeavor to do such a thing? <laughs> Coaching the coaches. You wouldn't believe how it came about. Uh, as part of our model of wanting to help youth hockey coaches around the world, we were doing a lot in rinks. And I'm a bit of a techie. I thought I can take it to a wider audience. So I created an online course for youth hockey coaches, mostly new to their coaching role or less experienced in hockey, how to play hockey.ca. <laughs> how to play hockey.ca. And I had some promo videos on YouTube. And one day I woke up and there's an email from hockey Mongolia at yahoo.com. Fast forward seven years, the same person is literally at this moment every day translating videos from that course with my permission into Mongolian. Anyways, he reached out to us. He's now our great friend named Puji, Puji Choi Chiljav. And um, that started the journey. He said, hey, I'm in Mongolia and I found your stuff and can you help? And it was my brother, Bo, uh, who's a hockey director down in, uh, in Baltimore, Maryland, um, who said, hey, let's, let's try to get there. Let's, let's go there and see if we can do our thing on the ice. So we raised $30,000 in 30 days on Kickstarter with a bit of preemptive planning and um, took a film crew, a CBC, our equivalent of like NPR or BBC, CBC journalist and camera crew, um, independent of CBC. They were doing this in their free time. Of course, I'd coached her children before and that's how we met, right? Because that's what happens with the hockey world. And um, so 2013, we ended up in Mongolia. Uh, things kind of went quiet for a few years as my brother and I both had young kids right around that time. 2015, the senior trade commissioner at the Canadian embassy in Mongolia had just arrived from a posting in Moscow and was Googling hockey in Ulaanbaatar, looking for a pickup game for himself with expats, Russians, Canadians, Mongolians, whoever he could find. And he found our link on on the site and um embassy got behind it and we've now tripled the number of kids playing in mongolia we've taken it from like 700 to about 2000 we've shipped two containers of used hockey equipment the nhlpa got on board and shipped 25 sets of gear on that first trip uh, we continue to have partners here in vancouver that store gear for us and canadian companies operating in mongolia who want to give back so they've helped fund the shipment of the containers and uh, if if anyone's inspired uh, i have the contacts and people are ready and willing to accept that gear and maybe a few things need to change in this pandemic right now but uh, you can do it a project like this you can get on board with us or anywhere in the world that you can think of that would be interesting legacy to leave yourself people are just waiting for help from projects like this amazing and it just puts a nice bow on this conversation about finding meaning and having an impact and vision and culture and people connecting leadership all that stuff 
Uh, Nate, thanks so much for joining me on the coaching project today. It is my pleasure. I think we'll do it again. Thanks, TJ. Absolutely.